I made a video about the first year of Pokemon Go, so I decided that I would also make a video about the second year. This is it. It's been two years since Pokemon Go came out in America. As we adapt to this world now infested with fictional creatures, it's important to document what we can, so that future generations can understand how we confronted the benefits and the detriments of the technology that surrounded us. The second year of Pokemon Go introduced legendary Pokemon raids, a quest system, and eventually trading. Many of these features increased the necessity to interact with other players. The second year saw the completion of the Generation 1 Pokedex for some, and the beginning of the Generation 3 Pokedex for most of us. The way things are going, this Pokemon MMORPG isn't going to run out of new content for several more years. Before I summarize my second year of playing Pokemon Go, I'd like to make a correction to something I said in last year's video. At one point, I said I had every Pokemon in the Western Hemisphere, and I didn't realize that the Western Hemisphere technically includes land that's in England. Land where you can catch Mr. Mime. At that point, I didn't have a Mr. Mime. And so when I said Western Hemisphere, what I meant to say was America. Which of course means North and South America. Year 2 of Pokemon Go began as Year 1 ended. An event was going on for the anniversary of Pokemon Go, and the Pokemon called Pikachu was spawning frequently while wearing Ash's hat. This was the third occasion in which Pikachus could be captured while wearing event-exclusive hats. But what made this time different was that, in this small period of time, it was possible to hatch Pichus that were also wearing Ash's hat. For the last two Pikachu hat events, I obtained at least one Pikachu and one Raichu with the event hat. So I figured I might as well get a Pichu with Ash's hat too. That is, if I could. Even though doing so would be significantly more difficult than getting the Pikachu and Raichu. I hatched a Pichu and it was wearing the hat. And my mission was a success. If you watched the previous video, you might remember that at the end of year one, several new medals had been added, including the Gym Leader, Berry Master, and Champion medals. I quickly completed the Gym Leader and Berry Master medals, but the Champion medal is quite a beast. My progress on that medal has been slow going, but I think I might finish it one day. I finally got to level 40, and when I did, I was the second person in town to do it. And I was the first person in my town to be at level 40 on Team Mystic. At this point, my town has something like 20 level 40 players, so it's no longer as rare to be a level 40 player. There's a rumor that they're going to raise the maximum level beyond 40, but personally, I'm pretty happy where it is. Even after getting to level 40, I still had plenty of things to do in the game, like finish the Dragon Tamer medal and the Fisherman medal. As time went on, Pokemon Go continued to be updated. They made it so after you finish a raid, you can still spin the gym. And they also made it possible to see what kind of Pokeball each Pokemon was caught in. And they were able to do that because that information had always been stored since day one. There was a real-world event set in Chicago at Grant Park, one year after the Japanese release of Pokemon Go. This would be known as the first Pokemon Go Fest catastrophe. After buying tickets to the event, people drove and flew to Chicago, expecting to play the game all weekend. Unfortunately, with so many people attempting to use cellular data in the same area, like too many people using the same router, few people were able to load the game. On the plus side, for those at the event who could, they got a unique medal, opportunities to catch Heracross outside of its natural region, and a vast increase in the spawn rate of unknown. At least for the letters one needs in order to spell Chicago. I didn't go to the event, but I know people who did. The important thing about the GoFest was that it kicked off legendary raids, which quickly started appearing all over the world, in the form of Lugia and Articuno raids. At first, legendary raids would appear abruptly, without the expected silver egg appearing with the countdown. Also, after you completed a Legendary Raid, that victory wouldn't contribute to any medal. I was expecting the Legendary Raid medal to appear, but when it didn't, I began to hope that they decided against making Legendary Raids and Regular Raids separate medals. But I was wrong. 
Legendary raids typically require 5 to 10 people to complete. So organizing within your community is important to consistently having enough people to defeat the raid bosses. That's why someone created a Facebook raid chat for our town. After I caught Articuno, the chat is what alerted me to the fact that there was a Lugia raid at a cemetery, about a mile's walk away from where I was. I walked that mile, yelling to players I saw along the way, until we formed a gang. When we arrived, we were able to take down Lugia in a group of 19. I caught Lugia on my first try, but others weren't so lucky. Someone later told me that they had completed 30 legendary raids without catching a single one of them. But his experience was definitely an outlier. I didn't pay much attention to the legendary raids. I made sure to catch a Moltres and Zapdos when their raids replaced Articuno's. But I mainly focused on finishing the Dragon Tamer medal and then the Fisherman medal. There were a lot of fun glitches. Here are just some of them. Kangas Khan showed up at events in Europe for something called the Safari Zone. When the Pokemon Zapdos appeared in Pokemon Go, Niantic accidentally used the texture for its shiny form. I honestly didn't notice until someone pointed it out to me. Ever since 2014, there's been a festival in Yokohama every year called the Pikachu Outbreak. It's a week when Pikachu caused mayhem in great numbers. The Pikachu outbreak in 2017 included elements of Pokemon Go. During the festival, there were raids for shiny Pikachu, and Mr. Mime spawns were there outside of its natural habitat. It was at the Pikachu outbreak that Mewtwo appeared for the first time in the world, and my long struggle to find Mewtwo began. All three legendary birds from Kanto returned to being raid bosses for a while, and Kangaskhan appeared outside of its natural region. At the 2017 Pokemon League Tournament in Anaheim, California, the Pokemon Go Plus started being able to spin gyms. So the fact that the Pokestop where I work turned into a gym ultimately turned out to be a great thing, since gyms give more items than stops. In Pokemon Gold and Silver, the legendary beasts, Entei, Raikou, and Suicune, were known to travel the world erratically, making the encounter of one into a chase across the Johto region. Similarly, the raids for Raikou, Entei, and Suicune were available around the world at the same time, but in different geographical locations. In September, America had Raikou raids, Europe and Africa had Entei raids, and Asia and Australia had Suicune raids. But in October, each of the legendary beasts moved one region to the west, with America getting Entei raids. In November, they all moved one region to the west again, and America got Suicune raids. It was revealed that in order to catch Mewtwo, much like in Pokemon the first movie, you needed to be invited and receive an EX Raid Pass. The conditions for receiving an invitation have always been vague. I had been level 40 since before the EX Raid invitations had been sent out to anyone, and yet it took me more than half a year to receive my first invitation. I caught a Raikou. The incubators got new sprites. I heard about someone rushing to catch an unknown and then running out of gas and a push notification that a lot of people got suggested going outside in a hurricane. There was an event for the Equinox, and Niantic got a new logo. Entei arrived in raids as I caught one in my Spanish copy of Pokemon Gold, Pokemon Oro, which was on my 3DS. I caught Entei the next day. Here are some more funny glitches. A rumor began about the possible beginning of Generation 3 in Pokemon Go. And Generation 3 did in fact debut with the inclusion of some ghost-type Pokemon in the new Halloween-themed loading screen. It was around this time when I was in the process of completing my Living Pokedex in Spanish Gold. After I traded it my Living Pokedex from Pokemon Yellow. In the end, I accomplished my goal in Pokemon Oro by using my French copy of Pokemon Argent. The Halloween event started, which added Shuppet, Banette, Duskull, Dusclops, and Sableye. 
It also added a Pikachu with a very spooky hat. And a hat for players, based on the Pokemon Mimikyu, which is from Generation 7. It's kind of ironic because it's probably going to be a very long time before actual Mimikyu appears in the game. But it is a popular Pokemon, so I see why they added it in early in this form. So I went and caught all of the new ghosts and a spooky hat Pikachu and Raichu. But as I suspected, there was such a thing as a spooky hat Pichu. So I decided that I had to hatch one myself. I kept hatching eggs even in the rain, but it didn't seem to do me much good. Even with my efforts, I was still without a spooky Pichu by the time of Super Mario Odyssey's midnight release. I was worried that my quest for Pichu would delay my enjoyment of Odyssey, but the morning after on my way to school, my special Pichu hatched out of an egg that I already had with me when I was at the midnight release. I could enjoy Mario Odyssey in peace. I finished the story, but my usual 100% completion of 3D Mario games has, in this case, been delayed by a Pokemon-related project. But we'll get to that later. Every so often, Niantic would add the possibility for some Pokemon to be shiny. And although it is exciting to find a shiny Pokemon, I know that trying to find every shiny Pokemon is a losing battle. You will either fail to complete the task or lose your sanity along the way. When the Suicune raids appeared, I failed to catch it on the first night, but the next morning, three more Suicune appeared. However, there weren't enough people awake and ready to take it down. On the fourth Suicune raid of the day, we had enough people, and I caught it in my first Premier Ball. Then, I'm pretty sure I went home and played Assassin's Creed Origins. The rules for raids had been changing every so often, but it was around this time that the rules became solidified. Before a raid occurs, an egg shows up. Its color denotes the difficulty of the raid. Raid bosses from pink eggs are usually able to be taken down alone, and raid bosses from silver eggs are legendary Pokémon. One hour after the egg appears, it will hatch, and then the raid will be available for 45 minutes. I then heard about a game in competition with Pokémon Go. It's called Draconius Go, and although I've never played it, any form of competition in the augmented reality genre is good news for us. Niantic is working on a Harry Potter-themed augmented reality game called Wizards Unite. However, I would like to respectfully call shenanigans. Here's the thing. Phones run on electricity. The Harry Potter books tell us that magic interferes with electricity. It's not gonna work. It's simply not going to work. Something happened called the Global Catch Challenge. The goal was for the world to catch 3 billion Pokemon in the span of 7 days. When a combination of players and cheating robots reached the goal, the Asia-exclusive Pokemon Farfetch'd appeared all around the world. And Asia got spawns for Kangaskhan. I was able to catch a Farfetch'd, thus filling in a gap in my Kanto Pokedex. Ho-Oh started appearing in raids, and I caught it in the last ball of my second attempt. An advertisement for Pokemon Go appeared in the App Store featuring the Generation 3 starter Pokemon, signifying that the Hoenn Pokemon would soon appear in the game. Unlike for previous generations, the release of Generation 3 would be staggered. A new feature was introduced, the weather system. Based on the weather in real life, every half hour the game checks the weather, and it determines whether it's clear, rain, wind, snow, fog, cloudy, or partly cloudy. And based on that, not only does the game look different, but also Pokemon of the related type will be stronger, appear more often, and in battles, moves of the related type will do more damage. There was a new loading screen for Christmas of 2017, and it featured a lot of new Pokemon, as well as a new item at the top of the tree. Called a star piece, it works much like a lucky egg, in that it multiplies good things for half an hour. Unlike a lucky egg that multiplies gained experience points by two, a star piece multiplies gained stardust by one and a half. The first wave of Generation 3 appeared, and the next day, it snowed. It so happened that unlike Generation 1, which released during a heat wave, Generation 3 released on a particularly cold week making no sense for the Northern Hemisphere, 
It was in this wintry climate that Groudon appeared. He didn't actually help the temperature that much. I caught Groudon, and then I heard about a metadite nest near my friend's house, and also a mudkip nest halfway between the town where I live and the town where I go to college. I staked out both of those nests while playing Pokemon Ultra Sun and Ultra Moon. I evolved Metadite into Medicham, and while I was at the Mudkip Nest, the holiday event started. This holiday event included the return of Santa Hat Pikachu, this time knowing the move present, along with the second wave of Generation 3 Pokemon appearing. Delibird also appeared for the first time, and after the holiday event ended, Delibird spawns stopped appearing, which makes Delibird the first holiday exclusive species of Pokemon in Pokemon Go. It will probably come back next Christmas. I caught a Delibird and then drove to the mall where I did some research. Wailimer was introduced, and just like Magikarp, it needs 400 candies to evolve. To evolve Feebas, you need to walk it as your buddy for 10 kilometers, and then it costs 100 Feebas candies. I also confirmed the existence of Santa Hat Pichu, and let me tell you, I had the worst luck trying to hatch one. It seemed to me that the spawn rates for the Generation 3 starter Pokemon had increased for this event, similar to what happened for the 2017 New Year's event. I found out that my buddy Relicanth was a new regional exclusive Pokemon only available in New Zealand. This was sad news for me because one of my favorite animals is the Coelacanth, so much so that I actually painted a mural of one at my middle school that stayed up for several years. And the only reason it's gone is they sold the building. I walked around the mall for days, trying to hatch a Pichu. I listened to the entirety of the book Frankenstein, and I also made some progress in Don Quixote. And then it finally hatched from one of my eggs. But man, it took way too long. There was a Willemer nest that would quickly get my 400 needed candies in the course of a few hours. And so I went there, I believe, on New Year's Day and grinded it out. Previously, Zangoose would only appear in America and Africa, while Seviper would appear everywhere else. However, around this time, they switched sides. And then I finally had both. January 20th was the first Pokemon Go Community Day. Every month has a community day featuring a popular Pokemon, and for three hours per region, that Pokemon spawns everywhere. During that time, it's very easy to get a shiny of that Pokemon, and there's always an exclusive move available in some way during those hours. In January's Community Day, Pikachu appeared everywhere knowing the move Surf. I only caught one of them, and it wasn't a shiny. Kyogre raids started appearing, so I went on a small quest for Kyogre and caught two of them. I would have gotten more of them, but I wasn't in the mood to raid more than I had to. There was a new loading screen celebrating New Year's of 2018. And one cool thing about it is that if you look closely, the 2017 loading screen is hiding in the background. The third wave of the Generation 3 Pokemon arrived, and among them were Solrock and Lunatone. Solrock only lived in America and Africa, and Lunatone only lived in everywhere else. I caught Solrock quickly, expecting that they would switch regions like Zangoose and Seviper did. Other Pokemon that were in that situation were Volbeat and Illumise, as well as Plusle and Minin. But Plusle and Minin eventually did reunite at some point, and are no longer regional exclusives. Torkoal was revealed to be a new regional exclusive, only living around India. There was an event in which Pokemon eggs would only hatch into Generation 3 Pokemon. I had previously not been using any extra incubators, but for this event, I felt it was worth it. And in that way, I got closer to catching all of the Hoenn Pokemon. They introduced items for your avatar that required certain achievements to wear. Relevant medals were Jogger, Fisherman, and Gym Leader. I found out about a guy who'd reached level 40 without choosing a team. And I gotta say, that's some serious dedication to neutrality. At last, the final wave of Generation 3 arrived. Not to say that we have all of the Generation 3 Pokemon in the game. We still don't. But the ones we're missing all have gimmicks. Ninkata has a strange multiplicative property upon evolution. Spinda has billions of forms. And the evolutions of Clampearl would probably require items that aren't available yet. Spawns for Swablu were crazy common for the first few hours after this wave hit, which was good because it requires 400 candies to evolve, just like Magikarp and Whalemur. 
Now, when I play the mainline Pokemon games, with one exception, I never look for shiny Pokemon. But they do have a habit of finding me. Interestingly, I caught two shiny Magikarps in Platinum, and a shiny Wailamur and Swablu in Alpha Sapphire. And so I'm 3 for 3 for having a shiny Pokemon in the main game that requires 400 candies to evolve in Pokemon Go. If they don't add to this list, I will be very happy. I was able to catch so many Swablu in the first few hours that I evolved one into an Altaria on the first day. Tropius was found to be a Pokemon exclusive to Africa. Cast form works a little bit differently in Go than it does in the regular game. First of all, in Pokemon Go, cast form doesn't change forms at all. But different forms of cast form will spawn during the correct weather. All of the forms were very easy to find except for the snow form, which only appears when it's snowing or if it's foggy. I eventually got a snow cast form and completed my collection. But what's interesting to me is that my collection of cast forms in Pokemon Go is slightly more complete than my one cast form sitting in Pokemon Bank in my living decks. Because in the mainline games, cast form always reverts to normal form outside of battle. Rayquaza appeared in raids, and after a few attempts, I caught one. The Valentine's event returned with a focus on pink Pokemon appearing, but this time it included its new mascot, Love Disc. Believe it or not, it was at this point that someone in our town reached the milestone of winning 1,000 legendary raids. That's something that's not going to happen to me for years. That is, if it even happens to me at all. But truly, that player is a battle legend, as the medal proclaims. To celebrate the beginning of the Year of the Dog, many dog Pokemon appeared in great numbers, and the shiny forms for them were added. There was a special raid at Japanese Pokemon centers where people would fight against Giovanni's Nidoking. There was a thing called Legendary Week which brought Kyogre and Groudon back into raids alongside Rayquaza. February's Community Day featured Dratini. I didn't get a shiny Dratini, but I did get a Dragonite with the exclusive move Draco Meteor. I started noticing a naming convention on Twitter related to Pokemon Go. For people above level 40, in order to brag about surpassing the required experience points to reach level 40 several times over, some people in their usernames included TL40X some number, meaning that their trainer level should be the equivalent to getting to level 40 that some number amount of times. I've seen one as high as TL40X10. Personally, I'm not eager for the level cap to be raised. But I figure that, whenever it happens, I can choose whether or not to pursue the new maximum level. Pokemon Day returned with Party Hat Pikachu, and for 48 hours it was possible to receive an egg that would hatch into Pichu with a Party Hat. Since we only had 48 hours, I started hatching eggs immediately. Four hours and seven minutes after the start of the event, I had my Party Hat Pichu. At last, I had all four Pichus of the Pichu Pocalypse, and I am probably done with my Pichu collection forever. Unless they add a new holiday like they did for Halloween. Since Rayquazas were raided more than Kyogre or Groudon during Legendary Week, Windy-themed Pokémon for a time were more frequent in raids and in eggs. It was a double EXP event. Another augmented reality game was announced called Jurassic World Alive. After the end of the Rayquaza raids, Lugia raids returned with a special move, Sky Attack. Because of this, I realized that if Niantic wants to slow down the rate of new legendary Pokemon appearing, it can. And it can be done while making sure that legendary raids still appear every day. Lugia on its second appearance was able to be shiny, making it the first shiny legendary Pokemon in Go, if you don't count the Zapdos error. All shiny legendary Pokemon in Go have a 100% catch rate, so if you encounter one, use a Pineapp Berry to get three extra candies. There was a second extravaganza, which I ignored. The March Community Day was Bulbasaur themed. I caught two shiny Bulbasaur and evolved one of them into Venusaur, which learned the exclusive move, Frenzy Plant. Ah, I remember when that move used to be called Solid Plant, back in the days of Colosseum. The kicker was that when you were giving your commands on your Game Boy Advance, I'm pretty sure the move was displayed as Frenzy Plant. A new loading screen appeared featuring Professor Willow and Mew. 
because the time had come to release a new feature called Research. In most MMORPGs, these are called Quests. Research comes in two varieties. There are randomly acquired tasks that, upon completion, give you a reward. And there's something called Special Research, which are essentially quest lines with storyline elements. The first quest line was called A Mythical Discovery. It has eight parts, and it has about 22 things you have to do. In a way, this research feature serves as a tutorial for Pokemon Go. Even though it was absent at the beginning of the game, if nothing else, it made me better at throwing curveballs. A Mythical Discovery was about finding and capturing Mew, although there are a few difficult tasks you must complete before you meet it. An early task is to catch any 10 Pokemon, and when I did, one of the 10 random Pokemon I tapped on was Shiny Swablu. Some more difficult tasks were to catch a Ditto, catch 10 Pokemon that were Ghost-type, and evolve another Magikarp. I'm not sure how difficult it is nowadays to get the Golden Kanto Medal, but you need that too. Also, in order to finish the quest, your trainer level must be at least level 25. In the end, I caught Mew, and now I'm waiting for the next special research. Since Mew is a mythical Pokemon, it's impossible to get rid of it once you have it. You're only able to catch one of those, and you can't delete it, transfer it, or trade it away. One thing I did after catching Mew was work on my Pokemon Ranger Medal. The goal is to complete 1,000 research tasks. You can receive one research task per Pokestop per day. You can carry three tasks at a time, and sometimes it can be a good idea to throw away an overly difficult task. My downtown area has 50 Pokestops, but my record speed for research task completion is 45 in one day. I eventually did get the Pokemon Ranger Medal. April Fool's Day arrived, and special sprites were added to the in-game tracker and Pokedex for a few days, as well as the collection screen. Those sprites came from Pokemon Sun and Moon, and some people got mad about it. I can't quite understand why. At some point, the joke ended, and the sprites returned to normal. Latios and Latias raids started appearing. Just like the previous roaming Pokemon, the Legendary Beasts, the raids for Latios and Latias were available in different regions depending on the month. Latios raids were in America and Africa, while Latias raids were everywhere else. Before they changed places, not only did I catch a Latios, but I participated in many Latios raids, and I caught a few of them. I figure that slow and steady wins the race, eventually. Maybe someday I'll have that Battle Legend medal. If that ever happens, it'll be achieved by meeting and teaming up with new people and becoming a more social person. In Pokemon Go, the rule used to be that legendary Pokemon could only be caught in Premier Balls, because legendary Pokemon could only appear in raids, and raid bosses could only be caught in Premier Balls. But this rule was shattered with the introduction of research tasks. Not only because you encounter Mew outside of a raid, but also because of the 7 day quest bonus. Every day in which you complete at least one quest, you get a stamp. When you have 7 stamps, you encounter a special Pokemon that can't flee. The special Pokemon you encounter depends on the month. But so far, in April it was Moltres, in May it was Zapdos, in June it was Articuno, and in July it was Snorlax knowing the move Body Slam. Pokemon Duel has continued to get updates, although none of them are for the main story, which hasn't been resumed since the cliffhanger they left us on over a year ago at the game's US launch. It's even possible to get the Ultra Beasts in that game now, which makes me wonder about how they'll eventually appear in Pokemon Go. An invasion from an alternate dimension is probably going to be scary. We should probably destroy any Infinity Stones we come across before something bad happens. Following GoFest of 2017, certain events around the world would be accompanied by spawns for the Pokemon Unknown, spelling out either the name of or something related to that event. Finally, an unknown event took place just a train ride away from me at PAX East in Boston. The letters P, A, and X were spawning nearby the convention center, and so I went and caught some before work. By catching three different letters, I earned the Bronze Unknown Medal. If I'm ever going to get the Golden Unknown Medal, it'll be because of some kind of worldwide event. Like World Literacy Day, or Week, or Month, or Year, or something. 
Personally, I think that every Target store should be an unknown nest because it's literally in the logo. There was something called Kanto Week which made it so only Generation 1 Pokemon would appear in the wild. I assume this was done to help people get their Golden Kanto Medal so they could catch Mew, but it also came with a really good deal for raid passes. One day, I was in the middle of doing my 1000 research tasks when I was interrupted by an invitation to my first Mewtwo raid. This Mewtwo, if caught, would complete my collection of every Pokemon available in New England at the time, and the raid would take place on April 22nd, 2018, the 11th anniversary of Diamond and Pearl's US release. This should serve as a reminder that Pokemon Go still has more than 11 years worth of content to cover. There's still a long way to go. I attended the raid and caught Mewtwo, and then I had them all, at least for a time. In November of the year 1620, a group of people known today as the Pilgrims arrived in America. Legend says that some of them stepped on a particular rock. About 397 and a half years later, that particular rock changed from being a Pokestop to being a gym. Since I happened to be there at the time of the transformation, I made sure that the first Pokemon to land in that gym was the Pilgrims, the Slacking. It so happened that the gym for Plymouth Rock spawned with an active Mistrevis raid already hatched from it, so I had 45 minutes to rename my Slacking and decide what I was going to do. There was some kind of event for fighting type Pokemon, and during that event I caught a shiny Metadite. Next time that event happens, I'm going to get as much Machop candy as I can so I can do raids better. In the first year of Pokemon Go, lobsters appeared all over town, and in the second year of Pokemon Go, two of those lobsters became Pokestops. When Latias showed up, I caught a few of them. One day I was with a raiding group waiting for a Latias raid to spawn, except instead of Latias, the Silver Egg spawned a surprise Lugia raid. Someone at Niantic screwed up, and I gotta thank them. We fought that Lugia, and my Lugia was shiny. For a few days, I had every shiny legendary Pokemon available in Go, but that was not to last. Ho-Oh returned to being in raids, and this time it was possible for it to be shiny. I tried to find one for a few days, but then I got distracted, playing Final Fantasy XV, Final Fantasy Type-0, and Final Fantasy III, all of which I completed. April's Community Day featured Mareep, and I caught four shinies some of which I evolved into Ampharos that know Dragon Pulse. May's Community Day featured Charmander, and it rained the entire time. I was able to get three shiny Charmanders on that occasion, as well as a Charizard that knows Blast Burn. Suddenly, Niantic announced that the Alola Forms would be the next group of Pokemon arriving in the game. There are 18 Alola Forms, which are all alternate forms of Pokemon from Kanto. Even more surprising than that, it was announced that the next mainline Pokemon games would be called Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Pokemon Let's Go Eevee. Set in the Kanto region, these are the first mainline Pokemon games for the Nintendo Switch. Lacking a lot of what we'd expect from a mainline Pokemon game, these are thankfully not replacing the core games headed to the Switch in 2019 that will begin Generation 8. There will, however, be a new Pokemon in this game, and I intend to capture it. In Pokemon Let's Go Pikachu and Eevee, it's going to be possible to send Pokemon from Go to a place in the game called Go Park. There, they can be recaptured for use in Let's Go Pikachu and Let's Go Eevee. It's going to be very similar to the Pal Park from Generation 4. And they say that Go Park is going to be accessible from Fuchsia City instead of the Safari Zone. That's exactly where the Pal Park was in Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Adventure Week returned with an interesting incentive to explore new places. During Adventure Week, the EXP bonus for spinning a Pokestop for the first time was multiplied by 10. I heard about one person who spent three days taking full advantage of it. During the road trip, a new account was brought from level 1 to level 40 by the end of the third day. They added rainbows to the game based on weather, and the Water Festival returned with Kyogre Raids replacing Ho-Oh. Shiny Kyogre was able to appear. I didn't end up catching one, but my friend Nick did. At E3, they had unknown spawns spelling out the name of the next Pokemon games. Let's go! This wouldn't really be news, except that one of the characters in the Pokemon game's title is an exclamation point. And so, the unknown exclamation point was released unto the world. 
I still haven't heard of the unknown question mark appearing anywhere. But then again, I don't hear much about any unknowns appearing anywhere. Alolan Executor suddenly showed up everywhere, and I caught a few. I don't think you can catch Alolan Executor anywhere anymore. So it's one of those situations like Delibird where it disappears after its event is over. June's Community Day featured Larvitar, and I caught ten of them that were shiny. I also evolved a party of them because the exclusive move Smackdown is apparently very good for some raids. The next Community Day will feature Squirtle, but it's not going to be covered in this video because it's going to take place during the third year of Pokemon Go. Pretty recently, friend lists were added to the game alongside the long-awaited trading feature. Trading is always one way. It uses Stardust, and IVs are randomized at the time of trading. Currently, you can have up to 200 friends, and the higher your friend level is with someone, the less Stardust it costs to trade with them. There are several medals that were added with the trading feature. One is Gentleman, which has an objective to trade 1,000 Pokemon. Another is Idol, which has an objective to become best friends with three trainers. The last medal is called Pilot, and its objective is to trade a lot with people who live far away from you. When a trade occurs, the distance between where the two Pokemon were caught is calculated and added to your Pilot medal. When you accumulate 1 million kilometers, you will get the Golden Pilot medal. For me, I'd have to either trade with an Australian 60 times, or a Californian 240 times. My friend Caleb helped me do just that, and I got the Pilot Medal, and I'll soon have the Gentleman Medal. The reason I don't have the Gentleman Medal yet, is that I didn't realize that you can only do 100 trades in a day. So I'll probably have it in less than a week. The Idol Medal is going to take some time, but we'll all get there eventually. You can have up to 200 friends, and each day you can send them a present from the friend menu. You can find presents by spinning Pokestops, and you can hold up to 10 of them at a time. You can send a present to every friend who's already opened your previous present, but you can only open 20 presents per day. Every day your friend opens one of your presents, or you open one of their presents, or you win a raid alongside them, or you trade with them, your friendship value will be increased that day. After one day's increase, you will become good friends. After seven days of friend activity, you will become great friends. After 30 days, ultra friends. And after 90 days, best friends. When you have three best friends, you'll get the Golden Idol Medal. But also, if you fight alongside them, in raids you'll each deal 110% of your normal amount of damage on the raid boss. When you receive a present from a friend, if your inventory of eggs has room, you will usually get a 7k egg, which is a special type of egg that hatches Alola form Pokemon. I was able to hatch all four, Meowth, Sandshrew, Grimer, and Vulpix. And I evolved all of them too for my Pokedex form entries. I also caught a few Alolan Raditas and evolved one of them into Raticate. The only Alolan form Pokemon that have yet to appear are Raichu, Marowak, Diglett, Dugtrio, Geodude, Graveler, and Golem. But I guess I'll take care of those in year three. Regice appeared in raids and I caught a few, and the other two Regis are going to appear later this summer. But I'm still looking for a Lunatone since it changed regions with Solrock. I caught a shiny Kabuto from a raid. Another Safari Zone event took place in Europe, and it resulted in Corsola appearing all across the continent. There's going to be a three-hour-long event on July 7th, featuring five free raid passes and a chance to catch shiny Articuno. My friend Nick caught a shiny Rosalia, and Celebi's quest line is probably going to debut during the second GoFest in Chicago. Spawns for the Pokemon Torkoal will be there, and hopefully one of the people I know will save me one. Luckily, people come to my town from all over the world. Now that trading is in the game, I'll be sure to ask any tourists I see if they want to trade regional Pokemon. Spoiler alert from year three, I already traded with a kindly New Zealander. So I only need Tropius, Kangaskhan, Mr. Mime, Volbeat, Corsola, and Heracross. On the final day of year two, they did in fact add another Pikachu hat event. So I went and caught a Pikachu and a Raichu wearing the summer hat. A few days into year three, I hatched a Pichu with the summer hat. And a few weeks into year three, I finished editing this video. Here's to the third year of Pokemon Go. Thank you for watching, and have a great day.